good morning. Welcome in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we gather on this uh, glorious day to receive God's blessings and hear his word for us today. Special welcome to um, staff members of our child care centre and to Claire in particular who will be installed today into that role and Lita uh, and daughter Maddie from uh, QX as well. Welcome to all of our regular members as well as those who are watching our service online today. This is a, uh, a regular service of the church but we include the installation and blessing as part of it today. Um, if you can't see the screen, uh, there are some printout sheets available from the ushers uh, to assist you if you end up behind a, a pole or something like that. A word from 1 Corinthians 15. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated as we sing our first hymn in these days. Just 
just and merciful God, you bring down the mighty from their thrones and lift up the lowly, and you fill the hungry with good things. Teach us to rely on you alone and to hunger for what is right. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As everybody takes their seats, I invite now Lolita and Denise to come forward and uh, read us the first two Bible readings today. The first reading for today, the sixth Sunday after the is written in chapter 17 of Jer Jeremiah, beginning at verse 5. Thus says the Lord, Cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make mere flesh their strength, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. They shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see it when relief comes. They shall live in the parched places of the wilderness, in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green. In the year of the drought it is not anxious, and it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is devious above all else. It is perverse, who can understand it? I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart, to give all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading of today is written in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, beginning at verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testify of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we are coached in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. reading for the day is written in the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 16, beginning from verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, the son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We join together in confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May we see it as we sing. And mercy to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord, as we hear your word for us today, grow us in trusting you. For the sake of Christ we pray. Amen. There was a father and his son out fishing for the day. And this young lad was a very curious young fellow. He had a lot of questions. And so he asked his dad a question. He said, Dad, how does the boat float? His dad thought about it for a moment, scratched his head, and he said, Son, I don't rightly know how that happens. A little while later, son had another question. He said, Dad, how do fish breathe underwater? His dad paused and thought about it. And he said, I don't rightly know, son. The questions continued one after the other. Why is the sky blue? And each time, Dad's saying, I don't rightly know, son. Well, finally, the young boy said, Dad, do you mind me asking you all of these questions all the time? And Dad said, of course not. If you don't ask me questions, how will you ever learn anything? Life is full of questions. Some are philosophical questions, such as, which comes first, chicken or the egg? Some questions seek answers to the great mysteries of the world, like where do all the lost socks actually go? 
Some questions you should never even contemplate trying to answer, such as, do I look fat in this? And then there are some other questions that have great significance for our lives. What am I going to do with my life? What's going to happen with our children? Will you marry me? Today, we hear about the most significant question of all. It's asked by Jesus in our Gospel reading today. And the way we answer that question from him has eternal consequences for us. In fact, there are two questions that Jesus asked today in our reading. I'm going to deal with each one in turn. The first question is more like a survey or a poll question, the kind that happens when we have an election on the horizon. What are the people thinking? What's the, the mood out there? And so Jesus asked the disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And the Son of Man is a term that Jesus, a title that he would often apply to himself. So the disciples replied, some say John the Baptist, who's come back from the dead. Others say Elijah and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. The religious leaders of the day, they would have had their own answer for this question. The Sadducees said that he was the prince of demons. He was insane. That was their answer to this question. The Pharisees, they said he was a drunken, a glutton. They weren't really sure what to make of him because he didn't seem to fit any of the boxes, their preconceived ideas of what such a person should be like. And it's no different today. If we went around maybe to Chermside or Toomble Shopping Centre and did our own little survey, our own little poll of what the people think about this question, who is Jesus of Nazareth? You might hear a whole variety of things. Some might say, well, he was a bit of a revolutionary, stood up for the little guy. Others might say, a wonderful teacher, great moral guide, gave us some great principles we should live by. Others might say he was a real messenger of love and peace, a real visionary for how the world could be. And there would be others who would say, well, that's just a myth, a legend made up by the church. Well, that in itself is quite absurd because the historical records of even his enemies indicate both his existence and his suffering and death, uh, his crucifixion and a number of other facts about him. No, throughout history, people struggle with this very question. Who is this son of man? Who is Jesus? About 100 years ago, King George V of Britain was going to have a royal visit to the city of Leeds. And there was elaborate preparations took place in that city, as always happens when there's a royal visit. And the train station was the place where he would arrive by train and there were huge crowds who gathered there to have a moment with their king. There was an elementary school that was positioned along the line, the train line, and the back of their, their playground boarded up against the train line. And they had made a request to the royal office whether the king could somehow stop along the way and acknowledge the children. So all the staff and the students, they, they gathered there against the, the, the wall of the playground overlooking the train tracks. Great excitement as the train came out of the tunnel and came to a halt right in front of their, their school there. There was great uh, noise and excitement as people screamed and cheered and waved as the, uh, the king, he wasn't of course wearing his, his crown or his purple robe, just dressed in a suit. He steps out onto a specially prepared little platform for him there and he acknowledged all of the, uh, the people who were waiting for him there, got back in the train and continued on to the station, to the other reception. As the screaming, the cheers died down, it was almost silent except for one little girl who was sobbing bitterly. And when the teachers asked her what was going on, she said, I wanted to see the king and I only saw a man. You see, it was hard for her to imagine that this man was the king of the nation. He didn't look any different than anyone else in the street. He didn't dress as... She thought a king might dress. 
And likewise, it's hard to recognise Jesus as the king of the universe, to recognise him as our creator, our God. The prophet Isaiah says in 53 too, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. So outwardly, Jesus looks like an ordinary human being. He sounded like an ordinary human being. There was nothing in his appearance to make him look otherwise. People knew the town where he was born. They knew where he was born. They knew his family. Maybe some of the people at that time had even had Jesus do carpentry jobs for them. And like any human being, he ate, he drank, he laughed, he cried, he got angry and frustrated. He suffered pain and he died. And even his death, as cruel and horrible as it was, was not that unique. Because there were thousands of other people who were also crucified in a similar manner by the Romans. No, he was human in every single way except for one thing. Never once did he sin. There was no sin in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Yet together with this human nature of Jesus, Jesus also seemed at the same time to operate with an air of authority that set him apart from all the other people that had come before him. He seemed to be able to cut through the hypocrisy of the moment and to look deep into people's hearts and minds, knowing the intentions of their hearts, the words that were on their lips before they said them. He exhibited Authority over sickness with just a word, people healed of their diseases. Demons fleeing at his command. Nature obeying his command. He showed authority over death itself, raising different people from the dead. He claimed he could forgive sins, something that only God can do. And he claimed a special relationship with God by calling God his Father. In fact, he said that he was one in essence with the Father. In other words, making the claim that he was God in the flesh. You know, there are many people over the centuries who have been in mental institutions who have said very similar things to that. But the difference is that Jesus was able to back it up with miracles, with his power, with his special knowledge, Even his friends and closest companions, they were terrified of him at times. We often see them falling to the ground on their knees, shaking in fear. Asking him to leave because of their fear. And they worshipped him. So who is this Jesus of Nazareth, this son of man? The Christian church has always proclaimed that Jesus is simultaneously truly human and truly God at the same time. The second question that Jesus asks in this text is by far though the more important question and a much more personal kind of question. Now my favourite ever single line from a movie comes from a movie called Beaches some years ago starring Bette Midler. And Bette Midler plays this uh, very self-centred character who always has to be the centre of attention in every situation. And in this one particular scene, she's talking about herself non-stop, just uh, ear-bashing one of her friends. And she finally takes a breath and says to the friend that she's been ear-bashing for ages, OK, OK, that's enough about me for now. Let's talk about you. What do you think about me? Jesus says some words which actually sound remarkably like that in our text today, but there's no self-centeredness in it because he's asking a life question. What about you, Jesus says? Who do you say that I am? Who do you say? It's not an intellectual quiz show question. It's a question of the heart. It's a question of faith. In fact, it's the single most significant question that you will ever have to answer in your life. As you stand before God on the day of judgment, the consequences of your answer are eternal consequences. Because implicit in this question that Jesus asks is, 
What do I mean to you? Do you believe in me? Do you trust in me? It's interesting where this conversation with the disciples took place. It's in an area that was known for its conflicting worldviews and its various religious opinions. Caesarea Philippi uh, is the place, also known as Banyas, and it's an ancient city in um, uh, Syria in the Golan Heights. And I've actually stood in that exact location where Jesus had this conversation with his disciples. And you can still see to this day some of the ruins of the, the pagan temples that were there, the ruins of the uh, Greek god Pan, the ruins of uh, a temple to Caesar Augustus. And it's right in the middle of these conflicting worldviews that Jesus asked this question, who do you say that I am? Peter calls Jesus the Christ. Christ, it's a Greek word, and it's the equivalent word of the Hebrew word Messiah. Same word meaning the anointed one. The one that God has set aside, the one that God has anointed like the ancients did for a king. The one that God has chosen to restore the relationship between human beings and the Father. Peter declaring, declares rather in this phrase, in essence, that Jesus is my saviour. Not just some helper, not an example, not just a guide. He is my saviour, my Lord, my God. This common, ordinary Palestinian carpenter is the one upon whom the whole world and its history hinges. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, as opposed to all the dead statues that surrounded them as he spoke these words. And just to point out, to say that Jesus is the son of God in that culture means to say that this person is equal in power, in glory, in honour with the Father. And yet, like the little girl who saw the king, some people just see an ordinary man upon that cross. It's through the eyes of faith that we see the loving king of the world who died for you and me, who gave himself for our forgiveness. There's a movie called The Last Emperor. It tells the true story uh, of a young child who was appointed as the emperor of China, the last emperor of China. And he lives a life of absolute luxury, has thousands of servants available to him, literally for his every whim and command. Whatever he wants, um, he just has to speak. It. And in one scene, his uh, bigger brother asks this little emperor, he says, what happens when you do something wrong? And the little emperor replies, when I do something wrong, someone else gets punished. And to demonstrate, he gets a precious vase from the palace and he smashes it on the ground and immediately one of the servants is beaten and punished for what he did. Our Lord Jesus reverses that whole pattern. All of the servants did wrong and sinned, but the king gets punished. Our wickedness is heaped upon Jesus. Our self-interest, our rebellion nailed him to the cross. But in return, he gives his life freely, graciously, so that we can live at peace with him, so we can be part of his family, holy, forgiven, justified in his sight. You know, we may have lots of questions for God, things that we in this life struggle to answer that don't make sense to us. We may have lots of questions for God as a congregation, in a few weeks' time at our annual general meeting, we're going to be talking about things with future directions. We may have questions for whole of the Lutheran Church in Australia. What kind of church are we going to be? But today, God asks us this one question. Who do you say that I am? Is he just the Sunday Jesus, the, the one we talk about for a couple of hours on a Sunday and then forget for the rest of the week? Is he the one that we just turn to when we're having a bit of a rough trot? Someone uh, to help us out in a time of crisis? 
Is he just a good example that we try to emulate every now and again? Or is he the one on whom everything depends, our eternal life, the one to whom we cry out, Lord, have mercy on me? That's what we actually confess in the creeds that we speak just before the sermon today. Apostles' Creed or in the Nicene Creed, we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ. Not believe in facts about him, we believe in Jesus. The only Son of God, through him all things were made. For us, for our salvation, came down from heaven, was crucified under Pontius Pilate. On the third day rose again, he will come in glory to judge the living and the dead. Today, I want to invite you again, encourage you again, implore you again. Trust him with your whole life. In your moments of joy and tears, in your moments of sadness and celebrating, in sickness and in health, and when your day, the day of your death approaches, to be able to say, I am yours, Jesus. My life is in your hands. I trust that you've taken care of everything for me. As the Apostle Peter once said, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words of eternal life. Amen. An offering of the word of the Lord will be received as we sing together the hymn, How Deep the Father's Love.
I'd now like to invite uh, Claire to come forward, and along with her, Lolita and Jai and Daryl, if you could come and stand behind Claire as Claire comes to the, uh, the front here. I present to you Claire, who has been appointed to serve as the service leader of St. Paul's Lutheran Child Care Centre. Dear friends in Christ, St. Peter says, each one of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. Whoever speaks must do so as one speaking the very word of God. Whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. Claire, you have been appointed as the service leader of St. Paul's Lutheran Church, a uh, lot child care centre, and you are required to direct and act in accordance with God's word as confessed by the Lutheran Church. Do you intend to carry out your duties faithfully? If so, say, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Claire, I now install you as service leader of St. Paul's Lutheran Child Care Centre, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. To the members of the St. Paul's congregation and to other staff that are present and families today, I encourage you to receive Claire as our new uh, service leader. Pray for her, honour her, support her, and work peacefully together with her. Claire, we have three representatives standing behind you. Uh, we have Lolita as the representative of Culex. We have Daryl as an elder of the congregation and Jai as Chen. And if you'd like to turn around now and they will each greet you in turn. Jai, if you could maybe go first. Claire, I, on behalf of the congregation, I greet you with a word of encouragement um, from the Bible, written in 1 Chronicles, chapter 28, verse 20. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord God, my God is with you. He will not fail you. Uh, Claire, on behalf of the, the elders and the congregation, uh, give you a word of welcome uh, from St. Paul in his first letter to Corinthians, uh, chapter 15. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labour is not in vain. Claire, on behalf of Culex and personally myself, God encourages us with a promise in Psalm 37 verse 5 where we read, Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him and he will act. And to those who are gathered here today, I invite you to show your encouragement and support with your applause, please. <laughs> As we turn back towards the altar, we pray for Claire in this God. Lord God, Heavenly Father, since you have called us to serve each other with the gifts that we receive from you, equip Claire with the gifts of your Holy Spirit, so that this community may be built up as it honours and serves you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And may God the Father give you his Holy Spirit to work in you and support you, so that you serve our Lord Jesus Christ faithfully. Amen. As um, the three supporters go back to their seats now, I Claire, if you could turn around and invite some of your staff to join you here. And if you could join together with Claire there facing in this direction. A number of staff are not able to be present with us today. But um, to each of you that is here, and to those that are not here, you have been appointed to serve the St. Paul's Lutheran Child Care Centre in various capacities. You've undertaken to serve the children and families of this community by providing quality care and to help make our centre a place where, I quote, warm, caring, respectful, open, supportive, friendly and encouraging attitudes are displayed and valued. You also have a role in teaching the Christian faith and Christian values to those children under your care. I ask you today, do you intend to carry out your duties faithfully? If so, say yes, I do. Yes, I do. 
I now commission you as staff members of St. Paul's Lutheran Child Care Centre in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for these staff members and others who may not be here today. We thank you for the gifts and abilities that you have given to each one of them. Give them joy and fulfilment in their work. Grant each one a genuine concern for the well-being of each child and their family. Help all staff members to faithfully serve in the work committed to them for the honour of your name and the benefit of others. Help us to support them in prayer and in our actions. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I want to say a thank you, a hearty thank you, to, to you and to other staff members who you have really uh, borne the brunt of a difficult period in time. You really have. With uh, COVID happening around and all the restrictions and things that meant, um, together with leadership changes, multiple leadership changes in, in the last year, uh, loss of beloved staff members too that were friends of yours and so you, you really have borne with a lot in this last year. So we thank you for that. And I want to um, greet you with this uh, word. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. So may God grant you his strength and bless you in all that you undertake. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. If you could please turn around now, and we will also acknowledge um, the staff with your applause firstly. And you might remember from other years that we also sing a blessing upon them. So this is a blessing that we sing to you. Um, so please.
continue to pray, Lord, for our child care centre staff, for the children and families connected to it and served through it. Bless Claire as she gets to know her team and the families who look to our centre for support. Keep staff members healthy and help them find joy in caring for the children entrusted to their care. Give them patience with those who present behavioural challenges and guide them in tackling difficult situations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the situation in the Ukraine where the inevitability of war seems to edge closer. We pray for the superpower nations of the world that they would seek to avoid conflict and pursue diplomatic solutions. Be with the people of Ukraine in the midst of their fears. Protect them and all nations that come under threat from others. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. We continue to pray, Lord, for an end to the pandemic. As many people grow weary from the constant change, restrictions and mandates, while others continue to suffer physically, economically or mentally because of the virus, we ask that you would help us to care for each other. As communities, families and friends experience tension over differing opinions, help us to see one another through the eyes of Christ. Help us to seek the good of our neighbour in all circumstances. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. We pray for our confirmation class, which began this past week. Bless each of the young people participating. Olivia Zaiza, Jessica Dunn, Caitlin Lockhart, Jasmine Croker, Lara Sabale, Wyatt Handley, Millie Thompson and Mia Esquivel. Grow them in knowledge of you and in trusting what Christ has done for them. Help them to form bonds of Christian fellowship with each other and with the adults who are also assisting, Nadia Thompson and Caitlin Raynor. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the residents of Zion Home and their families, along with all staff and volunteers, as the lockdowns continue there. Use our video recordings of worship services to be a source of hope and light for residents, sustaining them in faith. Be with the temporary chaplain, Gillian Reed, as she serves Zion for two days per week. Help her use her limited time effectively. We pray also for Val Scott, who has recently moved into Zion. Comfort her, Lord, as she adjusts, as she adjusts to this huge life change and her loss of independence. Help her find new friendships and support there. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask that you would remember all those in our church community, our families and beyond who are struggling with end life challenges. Where it is your will, grant your healing mercy and complete recovery to Angelique Esquivel, Val Scott, June Wake, Phil Hill, Leo Kaker, Dalmain Fan, Neville Dunn, and all those whom we know and name silently before you now. Say farewell to you at this point and we pray that you go with the blessing of God upon you.